Howdy howdy, I'm Kanaju, and I'm a sucker for cut content in video games. I used to spend hours combing over any pre-release Bioshock Infinite footage I could find and noting all of the differences between it and the final product. In fact, I used to do the same with No Man's Sky pre-release trailers too. You see, I find those differences fascinating for the glimpses they give us into the development process. You know, what a developer decides to cut or improve upon or change. It's all really interesting to me. However, going through No Man's Sky's old trailers and pointing out stuff that isn't in the game, I mean, that's been done to death. So instead, I thought it'd be fun to take a look at explorable interiors that were cut from the game years after launch, usually replaced by something newer or better. So today, we're looking at five interior spaces you can no longer explore as of June 2022, in no particular order. Number one. The original Space Anomaly. Back when the game launched, there were exactly three points of interest you could visit in space. You had regular space stations, Atlas stations, and the Space Anomaly. Unlike the bustling metropolis that is today's Space Anomaly though, Nada and Polo's interdimensional spaceship used to function more like a random event, spawning in every few warps outside of the player's control. It originally featured a single landing pad and a round room at its center. Atlas Rises added a simulation room on the left side in 2017. In 2018, a new room with the Quicksilver Synthesis Companion was added to the back. Three additional landing pads were eventually added for multiplayer parties, though I don't think I could ever get them to work. However, with the 2019 Beyond update, Hello Games completely replaced the old Anomaly interior with the new one. Almost everything is completely different, though Nada and Polo can still be found near the center. The Quicksilver Synthesis Companion also kept their little kiosk, though now it's a lot more prominent than it was before. The only actual preserved section from the old anomaly is the simulation room, which still features the same sort of hexagon design as the original interior. I personally love the look of the original anomaly. It felt mysterious and a little rickety. But I also love the new one. Its circuit board inspired designs make me feel like I've stepped out from the main universe into a space between digital realities. Still, in a game with so few unique space stations to explore, it's always a shame to lose one, even if it's in favor of something bigger and better. Number two, habitable bases. Since next in 2018, players have been able to build a base wherever they like. You simply place the base computer anywhere and go to town. However, back in the day, players would need to locate an existing habitable base and claim it for themselves. While from the outside, habitable bases look just like a cylindrical room, they actually featured some unique aspects on the inside that even modern bases lack. Firstly, they came with a built-in teleporter, no power required. Teleporters were added alongside base building in the Foundation update, so the idea of being able to teleport up to the space station from your planetary base? Incredibly novel, let alone teleporting between systems. As you can see, you can only connect your teleporter to a single space station at a time, so it was really limited compared to today's teleporters. Besides that though, your habitable base also featured a computer mainframe. Fans of the channel probably recognize this from last week's video about removed features, check that out if you haven't. But if you missed that video, one of this mainframe's unique features was the ability to let guests quote unquote register their visit, which unlocked new decals for them to use in base building. It wasn't that detailed of a feature, but I wouldn't mind an improved version back in the game. Plus, the mainframe had a cool animation. Another unique feature of these old habitable bases was that they had blueprint vendors. Now, vendors were added to space stations in 2017's Pathfinder update. They were in the same room as the teleporter. However, in order to save you the trouble of loading back and forth, which back then was a lot more tedious than it is now, Hello Games decided to simply add one to your base too. I always thought it was kind of funny because you'd essentially walk up to this guy's little hut, you know, in the middle of nowhere, his place of business, and you would just claim it for yourself. But then again, my vendor made a lot of nanites off of me, so maybe they did get the better end of the deal. Unfortunately, there's no way to place a vendor in your bases currently. The blueprint vendor was replaced by the blueprint analyzer. It's a real shame since that also means we can't place that cool holographic sign that they used to have. Who knows, maybe we'll get something like that in the future. Before I move on though, the base core also had a previous base cache built in, as you can see right into the vendor stand. 
but since you can build nearly identical ones today, it's not that special, but cool nonetheless. Alright, number three, space stations. Space stations within No Man's Sky are one of those things that have been updated several times over the years while simultaneously feeling like they haven't been updated in years. <laughs> if you visit a space station today, you'll find tons of NPCs walking around and chatting. You'd see a teleporter, trade terminals, mission agent, cartographer, guild envoy, and plenty of vendors in addition to other services. Space stations are bustling places, no doubt, but they didn't used to be. While the overall layout of space stations hasn't really changed since they were first shown pre-release, the rooms to either side have changed considerably. I'm actually going to work backwards from the current design in this case, as I think the oldest version is the most interesting. So, this is the space station 2022, that animated station core was added in 2021's Prisms update. Prior to that, it was just a vague glowing thing. NPCs gained the ability to walk in 2019's Beyond update. Prior to that, they would just stand in place. The expanded station layout with two platforms was added in 2018's next update. Prior to that, you just had the two rooms off to the side. Funny enough, this original layout is still in the game in the form of abandoned space stations. So if you ever wondered why there is an empty room on the right side of every space station, it's just a leftover from these original station layouts. Back to the timeline though, 2017's Atlas Rises added the mission agent, uh, Pathfinder added the blueprint vendor, 2016's Foundation update added the teleporter, and three hireable NPCs to the bar slash lounge area. You know, before this, you'd meet a maximum, a maximum, of one alien per space station, I kid you not. I still remember being really impressed with this change since it was also the first time you could see multiple alien races in the same system together. Pretty crazy to imagine now with all the settlements and, and things we have today that just seeing three aliens in a room together was like mind blowing. But you know, that's how it was back then. All of this is leading back to 1.0's original space station interior. You see, 1.0 space stations had something that no other version of the game had. They had these things. It looks like a cryostasis chamber, maybe like a medical pod. Regardless, these were manual save points. Similar to the ones you'd find on planets, these would save a game for you. Now, considering your game saves when you get out of your ship, it's pretty easy to see why these were removed from the game, but I still wish they could have repurposed them somehow. For example, maybe you could pay to top off your health. Again, food makes this a little redundant too, but for those players who don't carry meat around, it would surely be a welcome feature. Although, now that I think about it, even as a manual save point, it could be useful because let's say somehow you screw something up with your autosave, it's always good to fall back on to a manual save. But if you're the kind of player who doesn't visit planetary settlements too often, you might not have a manual save for several hours. So putting these in space stations would probably have been a, a pretty good idea, if only for that. Now before I move on to the next one, it's important that I talk about the locked rooms found in these old space stations because they didn't always contain the same stuff that modern locked rooms had. Specifically, I mean the room on the left side, locked behind an Atlas Pass V1 door, I believe. That would often contain a suit upgrade station. So before these upgrade stations became permanent fixtures of both the Anomaly and the regular space station, this was the most reliable place to find them. By locking them behind an Atlas Pass door and leaving the inclusion up to RNG, each time you did find one, it was more exciting than it is today. It also made drop pods more valuable since you couldn't just summon the anomaly at will and guarantee a suit upgrade in every system you visited. Nowadays, there's only one locked room per space station, and these really haven't changed much since Next in 2018. It goes without saying that they could really use some sprucing up, especially since these are the only doors that require a level 3 Atlas Pass, yet they don't offer anything you couldn't find with a level 2 pass on a planet. But you know what? This is actually bleeding into my number 4 removed interior type, planetary buildings and locked rooms. Now I need to put a little asterisk next to this one since these spaces weren't really removed, they were just improved over the years with new curtains and tablecloths. And yes, curtains and tablecloths. Functionally, we haven't really lost much in the main areas of these planetary bases, however, many people don't know that 
like space stations, we did actually lose these cool save chambers. I don't know if they were present in 1.0, I, I hadn't seen one, but you can see a functional one in this IGN first gameplay from 2016. Nowadays we have outdoor save beacons that serve the same purpose, plus they're uploadable, so these old save points no longer make any sense to put inside the buildings. But again, it's, it's always cool to see, and I'm pretty sure they repurposed this vertical version as the model for the a suit upgrade station, but I could be wrong on that. So, since both planetary buildings and space stations share the same pool of these procedural locked rooms, both of them lost the rooms that contained suit upgrade stations at the same time. However, it feels like a more significant loss for buildings, since this provided a neat incentive to explore every room of every settlement you came across. In a similar way, there also used to be a chance that a multi-tool cabinet would spawn in one of these locked rooms. That meant any planetary building might have a multi-tool worth buying, and again, this created another incentive to explore these back rooms. This was also possible on space stations as far as I know. Unfortunately, I don't have a screenshot of one on my computer, but you can imagine what that looks like. So you might be thinking to yourself, it doesn't make a lot of sense to remove these variety and exploration enhancing rooms until you consider the possible technical limitations. You see, planetary buildings and space stations shared the same procedural rooms. Since space stations didn't have guaranteed suit upgrades or multi-tools back then, it made sense to have these power-ups in the procedural pool. However, once space stations added these permanently, I believe the engine was actually unable to handle two of these objects in a single building instance. You see, buildings only have a set number of variables to work with. For example, a building might have a variable assigned to it which decides which multi-tool will spawn if a cabinet is present. However, if there are two cabinets in a single building, such as a space station, they would both carry the same multi-tool, theoretically, or even share the same inventory. So buying one might empty the other cabinet. The same could also apply to the suit upgrade. This is sort of speculation on my part, but it's based on my own observations over the years of certain things. If you like redeem one nanite machine on the wall, it'll kind of disable all of the ones in the same space station, or at least it'll turn them off, but they won't be disabled. So it's a real shame that, you know, by adding these suit upgrades and multi-tools as permanent fixtures to space stations, we ended up losing them as possible procedural rewards on planets. Eh, hopefully they add something to these in the future since nowadays these buildings rarely offer any surprises. But finally, number five, original freighter interiors. Have you ever wondered why there are two platforms separating your rows of landing pads within your freighter? Why you have to walk up and down these little stairs to get from one row to the next? Well, believe it or not, these raised platforms used to have two staircases each that would lead up to the freighter bridge and base above. The bridge wasn't locked behind an airlock like it is today, so you could jetpack up to it or jump down from it pretty quickly. Crew members were also placed slightly differently, I think there were a couple more back then, but other than that, the main difference was that you would enter the bridge from the second floor, rather than the first. As cool as it is to enter the bridge and look down on everything, I think it's more convenient today just to run in. Fun fact, during the Atlas Rises era, I remember seeing a ton of freighters that would have a traveler on their crew. In fact, I took a bunch of screenshots, which I'm showing you now. I'm not sure if this is still possible in the current game. I haven't seen it personally in years, but let me know if you have in the comments below. Back to the freighter though, across from the bridge, connected via catwalk, was the customizable freighter base. Unlike freighter bases of today, these used parts from planetary base building, instead of dedicated, you know, freighter base building parts. The first room was a modified cylindrical room, similar to the habitable base, but from here you could build with the prefab and cuboid rooms and tunnels that you could use on the ground. You could also place your base NPCs, similar to how you can today, although I recall them being really buggy when it came out. Overall though, I would say I prefer the freighter building parts that we have today more than the old cuboid rooms, but I do miss the catwalks and the convenience of the old hangar bay layout. It was nice that once you were done with, you know, harvesting plants or talking to an NPC, you would just jump off the catwalk and immediately land on your ship. It was one of my favorite things to do. But hey, if you have an opinion on it, let me know in the comments below. And actually, that's the end of my list. 
So let me know if you remember any of these and whether you'd like to see any of them return. Personally, I'd love to see those save chambers and the extra multi-tool cabinets return, especially if those cabinets held rarer multi-tools than regular cabinets. But hey, that might just be me. Thanks as always for watching and leaving a like, wink wink. If you're new here, I make No Man's Sky videos every Friday focusing on some random aspect of the game and exploring it to my heart's content, just like this one. When I have the time, I also upload a bonus video during the week that could cover any game in a similar fashion. Usually No Man's Sky though, gotta be honest, but if that sounds like it's worth paying, I don't know, $40 a month to subscribe, then I've got some good news for you. Because subscribing doesn't cost you $40 a month, it doesn't even cost you $20 a month. For an unlimited time only, you can subscribe for absolutely free. So what are you waiting for? You'll never find a better price than this. And to all of my existing subscribers, thanks as always for your support. I'm really looking forward to the uh, Q&A next week. And if you missed that, there's a post on my community tab where I'm taking questions pretty much about anything. And I'm going to answer them in a, a subscriber celebration video in the next week or two. So if you haven't done that yet, you still have a chance. I'll probably be going through those on Monday, so feel free to leave a comment or a question before then, and hopefully it'll show up in the video. So thanks again for all the support. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next week. Bye!